Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Thursday, August 10th, 2017 edition of VR News. Let's dive right into VR News, starting with our first story coming to us from south of the equator. Guys, after how Australians literally and figuratively got shafted for decades with an absolutely antiquated video game rating system that, if you can believe it, topped out at age 15. Well, after all of that, I do not begrudge them this very limited Vive bundle. It's centered around the game Front Defense. It's going to be released, like I said, only in Australia, August 24th, via the Australian Vive website. Now, you can purchase skins for your HTC Vive, I believe for the Rift as well. Just There's companies that do aftermarket skins. You don't have to purchase them in a bundle. I believe there's white skins for sure. I've seen red, blue, etc. I'm going to have links to some of those companies in the description below for you. Next up, we've got some details on this year's Oculus Connect 4, which is going to be held in San Jose, October 11th and 12th. One of the events is going to feature employees from Ready at Dawn. They're going to be doing a post-mortem on their VR game, Lone Echo. The things they learned, what they would do differently if they had to do it all over again. They're going to be discussing some more specific topics as well. Topics like locomotion. Carmack, and this has become kind of a popular event. It's called the Carmack App Critique, where basically think of it kind of like a dragon den minus the investment. Well, minus the dollar investment, you might consider advice or critique a form of investment, but that's exactly what he does. So he checks out some kind of VR app and then he critiques it, what could be better, what he doesn't like, etc. Another topic during the Connect 4 conference, the Rift SDK is going to get some focus time in the form of panel discussion. There's also going to be a discussion from Oculus engineers on spatial audio technologies, but I'm going to get into that towards the end of the news. Also, an early leak has release notes for PlayStation 4 firmware 5.0, and those notes indicate that Twitch streaming at 1080p and 60 frames per second is going to come to the PlayStation 4 Pro. So it's not going to come to the regular console, just the 4 Pro. Until this point, streamers were basically limited by frame rate and resolution whenever they would showcase VR titles. The guesstimate, and this is from Upload VR, and again, this is pretty much speculation. I haven't personally seen any of the leaked documents. Well, Upload VR's guesstimate for a launch based on the historical kind of releases of them about six weeks. So basically late September at the earliest. This was an interesting one. Entertainment Weekly, a small column based on an interview with one of their writers with Jeff Bridges, who starred, of course, in Tron and the follow-up movie Tron Legacy, which I personally didn't like as much as the first, but hey, Nostalgia, right? It's a powerful thing. So he asked Bridges about the rumors of Tron 3 or a third Tron movie. And here's what he said specifically. Yeah, yeah, I've heard those rumors too. I hope that happens. I think Joe's got the script and everything, you know. Yeah, I don't know that I'm supposed to talk about it or not. I don't know. It should be the first virtual reality movie, you know. Wouldn't that be cool to see Tron in that world? Just speaking from my part, absolutely. If you could pick one movie where, you know, you would make that the first full feature length film to be viewable in VR, I'd probably go with Tron 2 for obvious reasons. It's all about computer generated characters in a computer generated world. So very cool. One of the weakest areas for me in virtual reality is audio. You're in this virtual environment, but nothing really sounds like it's coming from where you see the action happening. It is something that engineers at companies are working on, including those at Oculus. And this is going to be another one of those panels. It's going to take place at Connect4. Just wanted to go into it in a bit more detail. So the panel discussion is going to feature Oculus Audio Design Manager Tom Smurden as well as Oculus's software engineering manager, Pete Sterling. So they're going to take to the stage. And I love this picture 
NVIDIA doing a great job of showing how physically based audio can enhance VR immersion. Basically encapsulates exactly what I was just saying about how sound works in VR. Spatial audio, hugely important for exactly that. Creating, convincing VR worlds. In VR currently, sounds don't have distinct sources as if they're coming from that area in the world. It's a lot more artificial. And if you pay attention to that, you don't have to be an audiophile, it's pretty damn noticeable. But simulating realistic sounds in complex 3D environments, well, it's not easy for starters. And to get it to really benefit VR, it's gonna take some elbow grease, some added work. Like I said, there's companies working on that. Uh, I think it's a great topic for discussion at Connect4 personally. I've not been shy about saying my favorite virtual reality horror game was Resident Evil 7 on the PlayStation VR. In fact, I don't think there's a close second for me personally, but one of the weaknesses, again, audio. With the right audio, holy crap, that game could have been of a magnitude scarier, right? And I'm not just talking the jump scares, like what wasn't there, just having the audio react realistically, just huge for immersion, especially in a horror game that, let's face it, uses sounds to ratchet up tension. I literally remember the computers in my high school like it was a couple of weeks ago. This was the mid 80s, 85 to 1990. Our school had those old black and white Macintoshes it had a Commodore 64, exactly one, in the school library, and it had one Commodore Amiga 2000 in the drafting room in one of the science wings. For me, being a poor kid, it would take me two years of paper route money to save up for my own computer. So for me and others like me, the school was our only avenue to be able to interact with computers and definitely set me on the course for computers being a big part of my life. That's where this story comes in. An Indianapolis charter school, and they are working with kids who have addiction problems, etc. The first in the U.S. to use a virtual reality program to teach science to their students. They've partnered with Iowa-based Victory VR to use virtual reality for their science curriculum. So a handful of schools in the country are going to start using it as well. Principal of the school, Linda Gaggi, she said it's going to be used to supplement lessons from the science teachers. It's not going to replace them, simply be an addition to. And here's what she had to say about that. An amazing way to deliver standards and curriculum and the VR experience for things they would never, maybe not never, but right now not be able to go out and experience in real life. The school supposedly spending around $18,000 for four VR workstations as well as licenses for those stations. Hope Academy, like I said earlier, for students recovering from drug and alcohol addiction. So I definitely admire schools and organizations that can do stuff like that story I talked about the other day. I don't think I'd have the, the patience to work with people like that in that capacity. Small little thing that we try to do is the used computers in the house, donate those, whether it's children's hospital, programs for schools, etc. At least it's one way to try to help and assist because like I said, yeah, wouldn't have the patience to do it myself. All right, guys, that is it for the VR news on this Thursday. Tomorrow, finally, Gaming Friday. Can't wait, plus the weekend. All right, guys, that's it for the news. As always, cheers.